Every house has its rules. Every house has rules. Things like do not touch the thermostat or take your shoes off at the door. Don't eat while you sit on the couch. Turn the lights off when you leave a room. Always use a coaster on a table. These rules often reflect the owner's desire to see their house continue to flourish and prosper. You turn the lights off so that the electric bills stay low and they can continue to pay their mortgage payments. You uh, take your shoes off so that the carpet lasts longer and they don't have to replace it. You use a coaster so the table doesn't get water spots. Every house has its rules for flourishing and prospering. House rules can also often feel frustrating. You ever got sat down on a couch with your cold drink in your hand only to realize that you don't have a coaster anywhere near you? You have to get up and go pick one and put it back. Yet we follow rules that even may seem frustrating at times when we know that they are aimed at the prospering and flourishing of our home. What do your house rules say about how your home will flourish? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the letter in which we are considering over, the, over, the, over these next few months, the church is called the household of God. And 1 Timothy really is a blueprint for how the house of God will endure. The Apostle Paul spent chapter 1 telling Timothy to protect the church from false teaching, which only produces speculations and leads to shipwreck of our faith. They were to do that by devoting themselves to the true gospel, which produces life transformation and leads to eternal life. Now, coming out of chapter 1 and into chapter 2, Paul will turn to consider positively what is to characterize a healthy home, a healthy church. And in these instructions to Timothy, we're going to see some house rules, quote-unquote, for God's house. Rules that may be hard to hear at times, but are aimed at the church's flourishing and prospering. So if you have a Bible, you can join me there in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll be considering the whole chapter this morning, verses 1 through 15, and considering characteristics of endurance. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to use one of the Bibles there in the pew rack in front of you. You can find 1 Timothy chapter 2 on page 991, I believe. While you open there, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Paul. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Stafford Baptist Church. It's a joy to gather with you to worship our God this morning. Let me encourage you that if we haven't met, to please stay after the service to meet and greet other people that I might have and others might have an opportunity to introduce ourselves. Well, before we read 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving to God for his word and for help in hearing and understanding his word. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that your love endures. That your love is as vast as the ocean. That, Father, your love covers all of our sin. That every time we go awry, if we come to you through Jesus, your love meets us there. Father, we thank you that your love was demonstrated in Jesus Christ on the cross. That as he paid our ransom, we were set free. And so, Father, we thank you that we might know of this Jesus through your word this morning. And we pray that you would help us, O oh Lord. Give us understanding. Give us life according to your promises in your word even as we see them here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before we read 1 Timothy, kids, let me encourage you to look for the word all. All. A-L-L. -L, all. And count how many times you see it in this passage. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then... I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. 
a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. The word of the Lord. Well, kids, if you counted all the words of all, if you counted that word, I want you to hold on to it, write it down, keep it in your brain. We're going to get there in a minute. But I think it's helpful before we get there to start with the big idea. Where are we going this morning? What are we aiming to see out of 1 Timothy chapter 2? Well, our big idea is this. Live as God's house in alignment with his acts of redemption and creation. Live as God's house in alignment with his acts of redemption and creation. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle is moving into what many consider to be the main meat of the letter. He's going to begin to explain how the church ought to behave itself. If the church is to be a pillar and a buttress of the truth, here's how they must live. And we're going to see several ways in which we are to live as God's house. But I think what's important as we see what we are to do, it's just as important to see why we are to do that. And so we'll see in verses 1 through 7 that the rooting of our prayer is grounded in God's act of redemption. That God's design of salvation as an offer to all people, but coming only through the one mediator, shapes how we pray. We're also going to see God's design of creation in Adam and Eve and how that gives shapes to the roles that men and women hold in the church. God has designed a particular way for us to live as a church. And so we are to bring ourselves into alignment with his ways and not exalt ourselves. So live as God's house in alignment with his acts of redemption and creation. Well, I think particularly we're going to see two ways in which we are to live this morning as God's house. First, earnestly pray for all in verses 1 through 7. Earnestly pray for all. So as we live as God's house, we are to earnestly pray for all people. In verses 1 through 7. And then, embrace God's design for you. Embrace God's design for you. In verses 8 through 15. My prayer and hope for us this morning, brothers and sisters, is that we'll be encouraged to bring our church more and more into alignment with what God has done in redemption and creation. Well, let's begin first by considering earnestly pray for all. Earnestly pray for all. There in verse two, chapter 2, verse 1, we see the, the word, first of all. That reflects Paul's moving into that which is of first importance. It's likely that he's moving into what is the, the main section of his, of his letter. He's going to begin outlining what is to mark a church that endures. And I wonder, friends, how would you answer that question? What is the most important thing a church can do? What is the most important thing a church can do? I imagine you have answers like preach the gospel, which is very important. We saw that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Or you might say evangelize the lost. Yes, we must do that. We must share the gospel. You might say love and support others, building a a gospel community. Certainly we must do that. But let's look again at what Paul says in verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. So as the Apostle Paul begins his teaching on how one ought to behave in the church, he says that every church must pray. We are to prioritize prayer. The most important thing a church can do is to pray. And we're to pray in all kinds of ways. That's what we see there in that list of verse 1. He says a prayer of supplication, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. I don't think Paul's saying, hey, you need to have a prayer of supplication in your service and a prayer of prayer in your service and a prayer of intercession in your service and a prayer of thanksgiving in your service. Rather, I think he's using the words to communicate that the church must pray in all kinds of ways. 
The prayers of the church are not just really a transition from one item of the service to the next, but when the church gathers, one of the things, one of the most important things we gather to do is pray. I've heard one pastor say that we should pray so much in our service that the non-believers there get bored because we talk too much to a God that they don't believe in. And certainly there's hyperbole in that. But Paul tells us that a church that endures prays. So church, let's pray. When we gather, when we go to pray, put yourself, commit yourself to pray along with us. We are to pray. We're to pray in all kinds of ways, but we're also to pray for all kinds of people. So now, kids, if you wrote it down, if you still remember, did anyone count how many times all appeared in the passage? Go ahead, just shout it out. Five, six. Okay, I got seven, so we're, we're, some of, one of us is wrong. But in the first seven verses, I think I see it five times. So five times in the first seven verses, and all of those but one are reference to a universality. So let's just look there in verse one, we saw be made for all people, right? So this is universal, all people. We see it again in, in verse four. He desires all people uh, to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. In verse two, for kings and all who are in high position. So you're getting that feel, right? That this is a universal in scope, wide, ranging, we're to pray in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people. John Stott, a British pastor, tells the story of a time he attended a church service. And it came to the time of pastoral prayer. And he recounts they, they prayed for their pastor who was on vacation, which is good. They prayed for a church member who was sick. That's great. They prayed for a, a woman who had just given birth. That's wonderful. And then the prayer was done. And he commented on that. It was like a village church praying to its village God. Rather than thinking about the poor and the oppressed or world evangelization, they focused only what was going on in the lives of a few members of their church. And brothers and sisters, we want, to, we want to be careful not to do that. We don't pray to a village God. We pray to the one God of all people. And so, brothers and sisters, this is why we have a variety of different kinds of prayers for all kinds of people in our service. So, Tangy this morning, let us in a prayer of praise to God and a prayer of confession for our sin. We did a prayer of thanksgiving right before hearing God's word. Kelton led us in a prayer of intercession. And in that prayer of intercession, we prayed not just for people in our church, but for all kinds of people. We prayed for the country of North Macedonia, who I had never heard of before I wrote it down this week. We prayed for people in Iceland and for our high officials and governing authorities. Church, in this way, we want to be a place that prioritizes prayer in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people. So how can you do that? In, in our gathering, how can you prioritize praying for all kinds of people in all kinds of way? Well, let me give you some tips. These are, not, these are not things you must do, but these are some tips that might make that easier. One, you can open your Bible and follow along as someone prays. So we prayed from Jeremiah 29 during our prayer of intercession. Open your Bible. Leave it open. Work through that. As, as Kelton was praying, you can read through that and you can pray along with him. You can repeat the words that someone is praying. It might sound a little weird at first, but you can repeat them so that you're staying engaged in God's, in the prayer. You can be affirmative as people are praying. So you can say, yes, Lord, hear that prayer, answer that. You can even do that out loud if you want. You can and should say out loud at the end of the prayer, amen, because this is not just one person praying, but it is the church praying. We need to prioritize this kind of prayer for all kinds of people. You know, one of the reasons that we print a worship guide is so that you can take it home and pray this way in your house. You know, one of the reasons it's hard for us to pray when we gather together, right, when we get, might get bored a little bit in those long kinds of prayers that we have, is because we're not praying like that when we're at home, when we're scattered. So this week, take the worship guide and use it. Guide your prayers. Maybe you can make a note down. We prayed for North Macedonia, so I'm going to pray for them this week. We prayed for our governing officials, so I'm going to pray for them this week. We prayed for Dan and Sally Walker, so I'm going to keep praying for them this week. Paul commands us, pray in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people. When we gather together, church, we gather to pray. Yet, for Paul, there is a, a focus in our prayers for a specific group of people. So look there at verse 2. 
he says, as he says, praise for made for all people. He says this for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's there in verse two. So the Apostle Paul is not only telling Timothy, hey, pray in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people, but he then gives them a particular encouragement. Pray for government leaders, those to whom God has given authority and power to exercise justice in our world. So that's why we prayed this morning for our governing leaders. Because Paul in 1 Timothy tells us this is how we ought to behave. And why are we to pray in this way? Well, that we might live peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. Friends, the aim of praying for our government leaders is peace, not power. While we pray for our government leaders week in and week out is peace, not power. We want to be free to live out the full range of godliness in our lives. That's really what those words are getting at, those descriptors there in verse 2. A peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified. It's not this idea of silent, isolated, but the idea of calm. We aim to live in a way that produces good for our city. What we saw in Jeremiah 29, verse 7, that seeks the welfare of our city. And so we pray for our leaders, no matter how ungodly they may be, to exercise the given authority that God has given them in a way that enables us to live peaceful and quiet lives. Notice what Paul does not say. Paul does not say, pray that our governments would make disciples of all nations. He is not saying, pray that our governments would govern so that they do the disciple-making work and we can kind of just live our lives on our own. No, he's saying, pray that, they, that you might live a peaceful and safe and quiet life, that you may live godly lives in front of all the people. So it's like they're doing the, the first, they're doing the work of clearing the ground before you can build the house. Right? They're not to build the house, but they're to clear the ground out of the way so that we can build the house as God's people. And this is pleasing to God, our Savior, because he desires all people to be saved. That's what we see in verses 3 and 4. Listen again to verse 3 and verse 4. Paul writes, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we pray for all people and, and kings in all positions so that we might live peaceful and quiet lives because our God has a desire for all to be saved. So God's desire for all to be saved motivates us to pray for our government leaders that we might live holy lives and call people to the God who saves. We pray so that we might join in on God's mission to save sinners. Friends, it is far easier for us to participate in that mission if our government is doing its job and creating a path for us to do that. We're not asking the government to go and make disciples. We're asking them to pave the way so that we can make disciples disciples. We pray for our governments and governments across the world so that Christians can lead peaceful and godly lives so that we might go about the mission and seeing more and more come to the knknowledge of truth. It's important that we pray this way because our God has a desire for all people to be saved. We know this from Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 32, God says this, "For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone declares the Lord, so turn and live." Our God is a compassionate God. And this is good because we do not want a God who delights in the death of the wicked. We want a God who takes no pleasure in death but offers all salvation from sin. We want a good God. But I do think it's important, friends, as we consider what Paul's saying here, that Paul is not promising that all will be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. That all will come to faith in Jesus. He's speaking of God's desire for all people to be saved, but he's not promising that God will save all people. In fact, it's clear from the rest of the New Testament that God promises that he will not save all people. Using the same language in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says this. He's, he's telling Timothy that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, that may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. There we see God may perhaps grant repentance. So we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, God is the Savior who truly desires all to be saved, yet at the same time, according to his sovereign will, chooses to grant repentance to some. My friends, we are dipping our toes into uh, deep waters here. And so we're not going to be able to step all the way in. I want to point us back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul 
explodes in prayer to the God who is the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever. He is uniquely king. He is not like us. And so we must approach God as we hear verses like verse 4, who desires all people to be saved, yet we know not all will be saved. We must approach God with a, a reverence, a recognition that he is unlike us. What we're noting here is in Scripture, God speaks of his one will in two different ways, while maintaining perfect unity and always doing that which he most delights in doing. Paul's not trying to give us a theological lesson, friends. What Paul's trying to do is motivate you to pray. So don't let the depths of the wisdom of our God keep you from praying. If you read this and you begin to feel less compelled to pray, you've missed the point of what Paul's trying to communicate. He's pointing to God's very real and true desire that all be saved as the reason why we are to prioritize prayer for all kinds of people in all kinds of ways, especially our governing authorities. He's, he's pointing to God's mission and calling us to join in on that mission. But in order to do that, we need help from our government leaders to, cry, to pave the road for us. This is how one author describes this working together of government and the church. He says it this way. In short, we don't want a government that thinks it can offer redemption but one that views its works as setting the stage for redemption. It builds the streets so that you can drive to church, protects the womb so that you can live and hear the gospel, protects the currency so that you can make an honest living and give to missions, insists on fair lending and housing practices so that you can own a home and offer hospitality to non-Christians, protects marriage and the family by not redefining marriage and by kicking strip clubs out of the city so that husbands and wives can better model Christ's love for the church. Paul here calls Timothy to pray for kings and all who are in high positions so that we might live peaceful and quiet lives. So friends, do you pray? Do you spend more time complaining about those who have authority rather than praying for those in authority? Have you given thanks to those who have authority in their authority, built roads that you drove on this morning to be here? Have you given thanks for those in authority that they continue to allow Christians to gather as we desire? Paul says to urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people, and especially for kings and all who are in high places. This kind of prayer that Paul is calling us to is not to keep us from having to share the gospel, but rather is to encourage us to proclaim the gospel. That's what Paul's trying to motivate here. He's trying to motivate us to pray in such a way that we are have a, an easier path to declaring the truth. We pray in all kinds of ways for all kinds of peoples because we know that there is only one God and one mediator through which we come to God. This is what we see in verses 5 through 7. Paul continues to kind of make this causal argument there. Verse, verse 5 there, the, the word for is, is a cause. We pray this way because there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I'm telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Friends, the gospel was birthed in a world of a plurality of gods. Every village has its own God. There was no need to be concerned about what was going on with other people because they had their own gods who were watching after them. But the message of Christianity is that there is one God. And that this one God is holy and just and righteous. That he has created us to be in right relationship with him. But that we have rebelled against him. And so we need a mediator to stand, in our, to stand between us. Paul tells us that that mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. The one who is both fully man and yet fully God exalted as Messiah. And he is the only mediator because he is, his death is the only ransom for all. There are not multiple mediators for multiple kinds of people. There is one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. It is his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave that is the only payment that can be exchanged in our place. See, the punishment that our sin demands is death. We could never pay that punishment. Rather, it is a cost that demands our life. But Jesus is the ransom 
he paid that punishment for us. And then he rose again that we might have assurance that his death paid the cost. And so friends, if you are here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that God wanted you to hear that truth this morning. That he so worked in the hearts of Stafford governing leaders 45 years ago to give us this plot of land that we might build this building, that you might have roads to come and arrive here this morning so that you might hear this message of one God who sent one mediator to be the ransom for all. This is for you. Jesus paid your ransom. If you believe in him and turn from your sin, you can be saved. He is the way, Jesus tells us, the truth and the life. So if you've never come to God through Jesus, you can do that right now, where you are today. You can believe that his death and resurrection are the ransom, and you can be saved. If that's you, let me encourage you to find someone after the service, someone who's sitting next to you, me, and we'll be glad to talk with you more about this gospel. But brothers and sisters, this is why we pray, because there is one mediator between us and God. But not only are we called to pray, we're called to share this gospel. This is why Paul says in verse 7, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Friends, if, if we only pray in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people, then we're missing half of what we're called to do. We are part of what a godly life Part of what a life that is quiet and peaceful, godly and dignified in every way is, is a life that's calling people to come to this one God. So this week, be the, prayer, be the answer to Kelton's prayer for evangelism this morning. Find someone who you can tell of the one mediator too. We cannot save sinners, but we can joyfully and boldly proclaim the only salvation from sin. So we earnestly pray for all, Paul says, because God desires the salvation of all. His work of redemption gives shape to what we do. I think that's important to recognize, brothers and sisters. What, what Paul's doing here is as he's calling us to pray, he's telling us why we pray, that it is the redemption that God is offering through Jesus Christ. So as we think about what we do, what we practice, the things that we participate in here at Stafford Baptist. We want practices that are not shaped because, oh, this is what we always have done. Or this is what we think will bring the most people in. Rather, we want to shape our practices, our programs, the things that we go about through the work of God's redemption in Jesus Christ. So ask yourself, how does our worship service align with God's work of redemption? How do our small groups align with God's work, what he has accomplished in salvation? How do our prayers as a church align with God's work of redemption? Paul's point is earnestly pray for all because there is one Savior of all. But not only are we to align with God's work of redemption, we are to align with God's work of creation. And that's our second point this morning. Verses 8 through 15, embrace God's design for you. Embrace God's design for you. Now, some of you, when you saw the sermon text for this week, were probably most curious about this section of 1 Timothy chapter 2. But now you're looking at your watch and you're wondering, how am I going to answer all the questions that I have about this text? And the short answer is, I'm not. But what I hope to do is to give us a big picture and remove some of the most obvious hurdles to understanding what we see here. And then I'm going to hand the baton off. To Kelton, who next week will double-click on this and take us down the the stretch run of it. So what is Paul's aim in these eight verses? Well, I think his aim is just as we saw God's work of redemption is to shape our prayers for all people. So too, God's work of creation gives shape to the roles of men and women in the church. All right, so you're tracking with this this is what Paul's doing as he's telling us what should characterize the life of the church. It is the work of redemption and it's the work of creation. A church that is built to endure will live in alignment, will joyfully embrace God's design in creation as we live that out together. This leads us to the first hurdle or objection as we come to this part of Scripture that's worth dealing with. Some will say that these instructions were for that culture and not for us today. These commands are, are intimately tied to the culture of Paul's day there in Ephesus, and it doesn't apply to us. And certainly there are parts of Scripture in which we see are intimately tied to the culture. 
So in Sunday school this morning, we considered 1 Thessalonians. Well, in 1 Thessalonians 5.26, we see, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Must we greet each other with a holy kiss before we leave this morning? The answer is no. I'm not going to give you a holy kiss. But we must, right, greet one another, right? The principle there that of greeting one another in a, in a way that's relative to our culture is, is the principle, and we are to do that. Well, the question becomes, if, is this, in verses 8 through 15, were these instructions for Ephesus only? Well, the answer must be no, because even there in verse 8, we see Paul desires that in every place the men should pray. So Paul's already starting to widen our gaze. This is not just for, for the church there in Ephesus, but this is Paul's desire for all churches. He repeats similar commands and similar instructions in, in, in his letter to the church in Corinth. And he's going to root it in creation, as we'll see in just a few minutes. So this is not a, a, a command for a particular culture, but it is wide-ranging. So what then are Paul's instructions? Well, let's, again, verse 8, Paul first speaks to men, and he picks up the theme of prayer there in verses 1 through 7. So he says there in verse 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So I think we move a little bit from the content of our prayers in the, in the gathered church to then the, uh, the way in which we pray, the tenor of our prayers. He says he desires for men in every place to lift holy hands without anger or quarreling. The, the emphasis, I think, is less on the, the posture of, of, whole, of hands lifted high, but on the kind of hands that we're lifting high, holy hands. As men lead the church in prayer, or in other ways, during the, the, the worship service, they are to approach it with an inward purity that produces unity and not conflict. So remember what we said about these false teachers. All right, what do they produce? Speculations and division. But when men are leading rightly, they will not be angry and quarrel. They will not be harsh towards others. They will humbly pursue holiness, and this holiness aimed at a unity in the church. So men... For us to embrace God's design for us is to be aimed at holiness. Think about your interactions with other brothers in this church. Are you aimed at holiness or something else? When you have conversations with them after the service, are you trying to encourage them towards a holy way of living or at something else? And as we do that, as, as men aim that way, we cultivate unity among the body. But Paul is not just concerned that men be aimed at holiness. We're going to see that women, too, are to be aimed that way. We see that in verses 9 through 10. Paul writes, Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So just as the men were to lift holy hands, Women are to clothe themselves with good works. Just as the men were to avoid anger and quarreling that causes disunity, women are to avoid prioritizing external beauty over holiness. Now, sisters, I don't think that Paul means that you can never braid your hair before coming to the gathered church on a Sunday morning, or that you have to wear sweats and sweatshirts because that's the only way to, to ensure modesty, or that you can never wear jewelry. No, Paul's concern here is primarily about clothing ourselves with good works and not being as concerned with what we are wearing or trying to flaunt a particular way of life before others. What are you aiming to communicate to others in this church? Are you aiming to communicate that I look beautiful, that I've got this, bre this brand new dress? Or are you concerned with the good works that you are adorning yourself with? So think about even just your preparation for the worship service this morning. Are you spending more time on what you're going to wear than preparing your heart to do good works? Paul's not the only one to give this sort of command to women. Peter gives us a very similar instruction in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, where speaking to women, he says this, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. You know, friends, the apostles and, and Jesus' concern is less about what clothes or jewelry women wear, but with what good works we are clothing our hearts. 
So sisters, it's okay if you wear the same dress three weeks in a row, or if your hair isn't perfectly curled, or you didn't have time to coordinate your outfit with your children. God is concerned with a gentle and quiet spirit, with a heart that is adorned with good works. It's better, sisters, to show up early, not as fancily dressed, than to show up late looking your best. It's better to show up and engage in good works than it is to, to flaunt our, our, the way we look. Friends, we embrace God's design, both men and women, when we focus more on the inward than the external. When we're looking at our inward holiness rather than, than that which will fade away. But Paul continues in his instructions, particularly to women, in verses 11 and 12. And in 11 and 12, we're going to see the same command, the two, same two commands, but repeated. So the two commands repeated for us two times. Let's read it, verses 11 and 12. He writes, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. What is Paul saying? Well, before we unpack it, I want to point you to a good resource on this. Uh, Kevin DeYoung's book, Men and Women in the Church. I, if I was more forward-thinking, I would have had copies out there available for you, but I don't. So if you want one, I'd be glad to give you one or, or order one for you. But so much of my thought has been processed through this book, and so if you read it, you'll probably realize that, and I wanted to acknowledge it up front that lots of my thought has come through as I've read the Bible and, and, and read this. So, what is Paul saying? Well, first, Paul is saying that women should learn quietly. Paul is saying that women should learn quietly. And right here, it's important to acknowledge that this was countercultural to Paul's day. Many women were not encouraged to learn in that day. But Paul, who is concerned to see the church join in on the mission of God, wants women to join in on that. So they need to learn and hear. But they are to learn in a particular kind of way. They are to learn quietly. That is, they are not permitted to teach. That's what we see there in verse 12. So that command, learn quietly, is then repeated in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach. Rather, she is to remain quiet. So teaching is the act of passing on the apostolic deposit by explaining and applying the scriptures. It's literally what we're doing right now. Right? It's explaining the Bible and applying that Bible to God's people. Women were to peacefully learn with an eager heart within a, a context of a church service that was not contentious or divided, but it was unified. But they were not to teach. They were to learn quietly, Paul says. They are to learn quietly. What Paul is not saying is a woman can never speak in church. Paul is not saying women can never speak in church. He does not mean women cannot pray or sing during a service. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5, gives instructions about how women are to pray and even prophesy during a service. We had a woman pray this morning. We had a woman help leading us in singing this morning. Paul tells Titus to have older women teach the younger women. Priscilla taught Apollos privately. So the command to remain quiet is in direct reference to the act of teaching men and, and particularly when, when the church is gathered in an authoritative way. The command to remain quiet is in that direct reference to that, where there are both men and women. When God's people gather to worship, a woman is not permitted to teach men. Paul continues, there's a second command here. Just as women were not to teach, they were also to not to exercise authority over men, instead to be submissive. Look at, again, verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. So Paul is not saying merely that a woman is not to domineer or to usurp a man's authority, but that her role in church is, is different. It's not one of authority over men. That is, she's not to occupy a position in the church where she's exercising authority over men. Instead, women are to embrace their God-given design for the sexes in submission to godly authority as men are encouraged to exercise godly authority even in verse 8 of what we've just seen in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We are to call to embrace the roles. Well, what are the reasons? What, why these roles? Look at verses 13 and 14. First, verse 13, and the first reason, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was formed first, then Eve. So God's creation of men and women, Paul says, means something. And this is vital in our country today that says boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Boys. 
Friends, we must understand that our identity as male and female is not arbitrary or subjective, but it's an objective reality with a good purpose and God-given responsibilities. So kids, if you're still listening, can you clap your hands over your head like this? There you go, up high. I'm going to wait till all of you are doing it. There we go. All right. All right. So I want you to know, kids, something really important, that God made you in his image to be united to Jesus by faith. This means that if you're a boy, God made you in his image as a boy and to follow Jesus as a boy. And if you're a girl, God made you in his image as a girl and to follow Jesus as a girl. And it cannot be changed. So I want to encourage you to ask your parents, what does it mean to be a boy or to be a girl? And how can I follow Jesus as a boy or as a girl? And parents, if you need help answering that question, we're happy to help you as your pastors try to answer that question. But we must say this, as we look at what Paul says there in verse 13, that the order of Adam and Eve's creation demonstrates God's purpose and design of genders. Genders that both, in unique ways, reflect God's glory and character. Adam, being made first, is given the responsibility to name, was made first so that he would have the responsibility to name, tame, and protect the garden. And Eve was made second so that she might nurture, help, and support. So it's rooted in creation, but then we see in verse 14, a second reason Paul says we are to operate in this way. Verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. There are a couple of different ways that we can interpret this verse, friends, but I'm just going to submit one to you. I think Paul is making a statement here in verse 14 about what happens when the roles of men and women are reversed. So we've said, right, Adam being made first made, meant he had the responsibility for loving leadership and direction. But he abdicated that role. He forsook that role and sinned openly. So when Paul says Adam was not deceived, he's not saying Adam didn't sin. He's saying Adam sinned so obviously and just sinned straight up that he didn't need to be deceived. He was just a straight up sinner. That's what I wrote in my notes. Adam, straight up sinner. If you read Romans 5, 12 to 21, you see Paul clearly di- didn't believe Adam was innocent but rather that Adam was guilty and he was the head of all who come after him as sinners. He bears the responsibility for the sin that occurred. So it does not mean that Adam was not a sinner, but rather that Adam forsook his responsibility to lead, to protect. Then he says, but the woman was deceived. Eve was deceived. And that, again, Paul speaking to the roles that reverse. So because Adam forsook his responsibility, Eve tries to step into that responsibility to lead and is deceived by the serpent. So Paul's grounding his argument for a woman not being permitted to teach or exercise authority because not only was Adam created first, but Adam was created to lead, to teach, and to exercise authority. And when that doesn't happen, when a man forsakes that, sin abounds. This is not a first century argument for Paul. This is a creation argument. Rather than embracing God's design, Adam and Eve supplanted that design, and tragedy came. So Paul is telling Timothy, and he's telling us, don't supplant that design. Don't twist it. But proactively embrace the design of God in your church so that you might endure to the end. This, embracing God's design, will produce flourishing and success. So friends, as a church, we're not to give in to the pressure of the culture around us. Culture will tell us that to be a flourishing church, you need to put women in certain positions, to be pastors and and have authority. But the Bible is clear that flourishing comes as we embrace God's design. This call to embrace God's design then culminates in verse 15, which again is a notoriously difficult verse with a few fair ways to interpret it. But again, I think Paul's encouraging women, keeping that main idea of what we said, to embrace their God-given identity. They are to embrace God's design of them, and one of the clearest ways they do that is through childbearing, which is often fraught with danger. Paul's not saying to be saved as a woman, you have to bear a child. Salvation here is not referring to the moment of believing the gospel, but rather to this kind of whole life as a Christian. And childbearing here is not the only way, but rather an example of how we embrace our God-given identity. Or as women embrace their God-given identity. Paul, I think, even uses the example of childbirth because the false teachers, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 
were teaching that they did not need to get married and therefore could not have children. So Paul says, embracing your God-given identity will mean getting married and having children, usually. Kevin DeYoung says it this way in the, in the book I referenced. He says, instead of casting off all order and decency, a godly woman embraces her true femininity in dressing modestly, learning quietly, bearing children, and continuing in faith, love, and holiness. Friends, particularly our sisters, you are to work out your salvation by embracing your God-given identity as a woman and continuing in faith, love, and holiness. Brothers and sisters, this is the call to each of us this morning. To embrace God's design of you as we live that out in the church. In this way, we submit ourselves to God, even in difficulty and trouble, as he works out in us our salvation. Paul is telling us God's created order has an impact on how we as a church live today. So let me call us. Brothers, first, that you are called to love and not be harsh with the church. You are called to lead the church as lifting holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. So be intentional to embrace God's design, not through domineering authority, but through a holy love that creates an aroma of godly learning in the church. Do not be like Adam, brothers, abdicating your responsibility in the home or in the church. You may not have an official office of pastor, but you can and should cultivate an environment in the church where our sisters can joyfully submit and eagerly learn. So brothers, are you doing that? This week, have you intentionally sought holiness in your own life and in this church? And sisters, you too are called to embrace God's design, to learn in quietness and full submission, refraining from teaching or having authority, And so embrace God's design of the church and learn of Jesus as you adorn yourself with modesty and good works as God works in you. There is more that could be said. And Lord willing, next week we will say more of that. And if you have questions about what we've considered this morning, I encourage you to to ask those questions as we continue to seek to better understand God's word. But I, I just want to close with where we started. House rules. Right? We said house rules are given for the flourishing and the prospering of a home. So let us remember that God's house rules are given not to stymie our growth, but to spur on our growth. They are given so that his church might flourish and endure and not falter in these last days. These house rules are shaped by his work in redemption through the one mediator, Jesus Christ. And they are shaped by his work in creation as men and women embrace their roles in the church. So let's live at God's house in alignment with his acts of redemption and creation. Would you pray with me? Lord, we praise you for your desire of all people to be saved. Father, you are a compassionate and good God. Help that desire to give shape to how we live as a church this week. Father, that we would joyfully pray in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people. Father, that we would cast upon you our concerns and our desires. Father, that we would pray for government leaders that we might have clear ways to live godly lives before others. Father, we also praise you because you have created us as male and female to live in light of that, as we go about in our homes and in our churches. And so, Lord, we pray that you would, through your grace, Father, help us to embrace the the roles that you have given us in this church. Lord, to live as men and to live as women, made in your image, united to Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.